The PlayStation, I think, is one of the most important consoles ever made. Not only did it thrust gaming into that 3D era, but it also firmly established some of the biggest franchises in the whole industry. With games like Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil, and of course, Silent Hill. Glad to hear it. Developed by Konami and released way back in 1999, Silent Hill had some pretty stiff competition at the time, with Capcom's Resident Evil series being pretty well ingrained into gaming culture at that point and the go-to franchise for survival horror. And for good reason though, I mean Resident Evil 2 had come out the year prior and it was my introduction to the series and really survival horror in general. I'd had my first taste into what it could be like having the absolute crap scared out of you. And let me tell you, I liked it. I liked it a lot. <laughs> Compared to the fixed camera placements in the Resident Evil games though, Silent Hill was a fully 3D engine and its plot and setting couldn't have been any more different. Where are you? Cheryl! It's an absolutely Kino horror game and it's gone on to become one of the most undisputed classics for the genre. Even now, over 20 years later, it can still deliver the goods, despite kind of showing its age in a bunch of ways. Yeah, thanks. It came from that time in gaming when development wasn't about huge, corporate controlled by the numbers design. There's a photo of the dev team, appropriately called Team Silent, taken back in the 90s and they all fit in the same frame like it's nothing. It was just a group of very talented people that were all good at one specific thing that just kind of put their heads down and got to work. No last minute crunch, no controversy over the publishers doing something stupid or one of the devs saying something dumb on social media, just a good solid horror game released on completion the way it was always intended. Now, being attacked by monsters and being trapped in an alternate reality is pretty scary, but not as scary as having your online activity tracked, which is why you're gonna wanna use a product like ExpressVPN. Yeah, do you like how subtle that segue was? No way. Yeah, I gotta give a shout out to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video, and let me take a few seconds out of your time to explain it. Right, so what's a VPN? Well, a VPN is a virtual private network which protects all of your information through an encrypted tunnel, which means you can browse safely knowing that all of your private details are being hidden. ExpressVPN routes this information through over 3,000 servers with you also being able to choose from appearing in over 90 countries. This can be useful for gaming, but it comes most in handy with sites like Netflix. Yeah. Thanks. Seeing as a lot of the stuff on those streaming sites is location based, if there's something that doesn't show up where you live, you can simply change the location and there it is. Yeah. Thanks. Anyway, I've been using ExpressVPN for about a year now and it couldn't be easier. It's about as simple as clicking the connect button and you're good to go. It's become as much of a morning ritual for me when I hop on my computer as much as drinking coffee is. The benefit is that you also still get great speeds along with it, which is good for someone like me living in Australia, where it often feels like our internet is being held together with duct tape. If this ain't enough to convince you, well consider they've also got rave user reviews, not to mention high reviews from tech sites like CNET and TechRadar. So there's no real reason to not hop onto ExpressVPN right now. And if you use the link in the video description, expressvpn.com slash gman, you can even get three months for free. Now look, there's far better videos out there on this series and there's people who are way bigger fans of these games than I am. But one thing I've always wanted to at least talk about is the place where it all started with Silent Hill 1. As this game is pretty much ingrained into my DNA as a gamer as much as Doom, Commander Keen and Metal Gear Solid are. Huh. And if all I can do from this video is make a new Silent Hill fan out of someone, then I'm going to consider that a win. So maybe you can tell me what's going on. Even from turning the console on and the game loading in, the story kicks off and if you're used to skipping out the opening movies before a main menu, which was pretty standard for the time, well it's even possible you'll miss out on this. But the story is that a guy named Harry Mason, still mourning the death of his wife a few years earlier, is heading to the town of Silent Hill with his daughter Cheryl to take a much needed vacation. Heading to this town to get a peaceful vacation though is like heading to Chernobyl to get a suntan. Anyway, their trip is interrupted when Harry sees the figure of a woman crossing the road in front of them, so he does what anyone would do and swerve dangerously to the side. When he wakes up, the area is covered in thick fog and Cheryl's buggered off. This fog went on to become one of the series most recognisable features and it kind of works in a couple of ways. Firstly, as a means of communicating how the town itself is being held in this kind of weird suspended reality, but it also cleverly hid the limitations and the draw distance of the PlayStation console. Certainly helped to make your introduction to the town seem way more creepy and unsettling and that's something that didn't really change the more you discovered the going on. 
Controlling Harry, what begun as walking away from a simple car crash ends up involving a weird cult. There's ancient gods in the projection of a tortured girl named Alyssa creating the backdrop for the whole thing. Along with a local cop named Sybil who wears a pair of leather pants that are so tight she's probably been sewn into them. You'll uncover what's really going on, the history behind the cult and the corruption involved with local town members. You know something? Tell me. Including a mysterious doctor and a misguided nurse named Lisa. So I really don't know. Scenes of dialogue are somewhat frequent, not to mention lengthy. Are you sure? The voice acting isn't amazing though, and there's times when you could describe Harry's reaction to being told key events as little more than mild curiosity. Yeah. But it's a damn sight better than what we got in Resident Evil, which kind of sounded like the voice actors reading off each line like it was the first word in a sentence. If we stay here, all of us will end up dead. Don't open that door. There was even multiple endings depending on whether or not certain factors were met throughout the story, like it definitely added a good amount of replayability. Yeah, I guess so. What I think made the whole thing so unique though was this addition of the other world that Harry frequently found himself stuck in. Which is kind of like a reality that exists within the same time and space as the real world but looks like something out of a rusty nightmare. Everything turns all industrial and grungy and the world becomes populated with nasty monsters and violent imagery. In games set in the real world, even horror games, I think there's like a sense of familiarity at least, because in a way it's like you've still got both feet on the ground. I mean, as scary as Resident Evil 2 was for instance, I could still identify with this place as a police station or a library or so on. But once you're transported to this other world in Silent Hill, I mean, all of the rules go out the window. And I think it's part of what made the premise so frightening to me, and like I said, they don't waste time in setting this whole thing up either. That opening prologue goes for barely five minutes before you're seamlessly transported there, in a sequence that's a bit of a homage to that hospital scene in Jacob's Ladder. That tone turns so quickly that it's kind of overwhelming, and you're ambushed by these monsters and have the same reaction as Harry does as you're barely able to get your wits together. And it's really something they'd hone and improve for each sequel, with that depiction of the other world getting even more unique and detailed. By the third game, some of those environments that you'd move through were pretty much pieces of modern art. A big part of what makes the whole thing so horrifying too is the sound design. Now there's some truly unsettling and disturbing stuff. Not to mention just masterful work in this game, coming from the mind of Akira Yamaoka. But I'm not sure that I'd refer to it as music, more so it's kinda like metallic torture in audio form. If someone ever took waterboarding and put it into MP3 form, well, this is what it'd sound like. Compared to the stuff that we'd eventually get in Silent Hill 2, a soundtrack which I think is pretty much damn near perfect. Lost? The music in Silent Hill is far more sinister and relentless and it almost never lets up on the player. Every single location and area you move through has its own unique soundscape. It just leaves this constant sense of dread and tension that causes your sphincter to clench up so tight that you could probably use it to crush walnuts. One of the main game mechanics is a radio that Harry's got that causes static whenever a monster is nearby and the sound that this thing makes is downright iconic. Huh, radio. What's going on with that radio? and it's stuck in my head as much as the sound effect of Snake being detected in Metal Gear Solid is, or Crash Bandicoot picking up one of the Aku Aku masks. What have I got? And there's nothing more terrifying than entering a new area and hearing that noise go off as you frantically spin the camera around to get your bearings. Silent Hill is just a really good example of horror done right. Compared to modern horror games like Outlast or Five Nights at Frankie's or whatever the fuck that thing is called, which just kind of rely on cheap jump scares, Silent Hill instead takes its time and just generally keeps you feeling like a miserable, uneasy piece of shit. Thank God. I think you can count the amount of jump scares in this game on one hand, and they're all handled really well, making that payoff even more powerful. There's one in a locker room early on in the game, and the first time this thing happened, my balls retreated so far back into my body that I could have gurgled them with a glass of water. 
The environment's do a good job of recreating a lot of locations that on a surface level, I think a lot of people can easily relate to. Locations like schools, city streets and hospitals, which just kind of make the threat seem that much more real. You start off on the outskirts of the town, chasing after Cheryl as she disappears into the fog. And the streets seem pretty harmless at first, but then once you get down a back alley is where things take a turn for the worse. And crossing from one side of the gate to the other, it's kind of like you're moving into an entirely different world, which you basically are. After meeting up with Sybil, you're then back on the streets again, trying to track Cheryl down, at which point you discover she's headed to the nearby school. At that point, it transitions from day to night, and the whole world takes on a much more evil tone that never really dwindles for the remainder of the game. Then you're at the school, avoiding monster children before crossing over into the other world, where the school turns into an industrial hellhole. Giant cockroaches run around, and the walls and floors are stained with rust, blood, piss, and other bodily fluids. It's about on par though for anything you'd come across in your typical Australian public school. It's nuts. You'll explore a hospital, an entirely different district of the town, a department store, and eventually fall right down the rabbit hole and get lost in what is essentially limbo. The worst environment of all though being the goddamn sewers. Now, I don't know if there's some kind of contractual obligation in video games where it seems that the sewer level always has to be the worst one, but Silent Hill definitely doesn't mess with that tradition in that regard. Not only is the sewers in this one super narrow and hard to navigate, but it's got some of the most annoying monsters in the entire game. These stupid lizard things that run across the roof. And it's about as fun as using a plastic straw as a catheter. But you can't deny it retains that same atmosphere throughout, and there's still something appealing about how they brought all of these locations to life. With that basic architecture they could afford with the limited PlayStation hardware. I think the dynamic lighting from Harry's flashlight still looks awesome. There's a cheap lens flare effect whenever you shine it directly at the camera, and the sight of enemies slowly moving down these long hallways menacingly approaching the player just looks amazing. Even though some textures are blurry and lack a lot of detail, the art style shines through strongly and the imagination of the art director, Masahiri Ito, still comes through. Not only did this dude create some of the most terrific monsters to ever come to life in gaming, but he's also a goddamn wizard with how to create the perfect honey toast. There's one-off rooms and environments you pass through that are just downright artistic. Rooms that might not even serve any other purpose outside of offering up a simple item. And yet they've been composed in a way that makes it obvious that someone's put a lot of thought and time into their layout. Part of what's always appealed to me with this game is how you're not playing as some kind of special forces soldier or a space marine. You're just some poor asshole stuck in a bad situation, making the best use of whatever you can find to get by. Um, no. It adds an element of vulnerability to the character, and this is also reinforced with some of the melee weapons. Most of which are items you just happen to find lying around. Like a kitchen knife, a metal pipe, and an axe, which most people could probably find in their own house, if not nearby. Melee weapons are surprisingly effective too. The hammer, for instance, has the benefit of knocking enemies back when they're hit, making it almost impossible for them to even hit you if you time it right. <laughs> Harry's first real gun is a pistol he's given from Sybil, and it's a hand-me-down weapon she kind of gives to him out of courtesy. Take this, and hope you don't have to use it. And then after that, the only other ranged weapons you'll get your hands on is a shotgun and a hunting rifle. Oh. That's about it. I mean, there's other secret weapons you can unlock, but the basic roster is intentionally bare bones. Harry's gonna slowly take aim before you're then able to fire off a couple of shots, and when firing weapons, your movement speed slows to a crawl. If an enemy isn't in range for certain weapons, you'll miss those shots entirely, which I think is a nice touch of realism considering you're playing as a guy who I'm assuming before the events of the games probably never fired a gun in his entire life. Hmm. The thing is too, you don't always need to kill everything. During interior areas like the hospital and the school, it's probably not a bad idea to thin the ranks out considering you're gonna be moving back and forth between the rooms a fair bit. But outside, you're better off just leaving these assholes to themselves. In fact, it actually adds a bit of excitement to these outside areas. Hearing your radio going off and seeing that shape of some horrible creature moving around in the distance, then running past them and hearing the flapping of wings or the pattering of feet. And yeah, a big part of what made the game so unique was the monster designs. Compared to the familiar sight of zombies in Resident Evil and other creatures that were a result of science gone wrong, the monsters in Silent Hill were the manifestations of a little girl's worst fears. 
Everything you encountered in this game was a result of a young girl's fears and insecurities being projected into reality. Oops, there goes gravity. Alyssa is afraid of insects, so enemies include giant cockroaches, caterpillars, and a huge moth. She's afraid of dogs, so you get a whole heap of those four-legged assholes running around in the streets without a goddamn leash on. She also had a rough time in school, so during the school levels you're attacked by child-sized monstrosities with sharp claws. Yeah, children can be so cruel. I do think that some people really overanalyzed a few of these creatures too. Like one of the monsters is this monkey looking thing, which hops around and jumps onto Harry. And I guess you could say that it's representing her fear of adults. I mean, maybe? Now I know in the sequel they went even harder on this and the monster started to also represent emotions and psychological states. But in the first game, a lot of these things are really just surface level. I mean, I just thought that the romper pinning me down and jumping on my back was a basic method of attack. But it turns out it's also a way of symbolizing the authoritative aura of adults and make it seem like an overbearing creature. Yeah, okay. I just don't get it. I mean, I don't know, maybe it is, who knows. I just thought it was supposed to be some kind of spooky monster monkey man. That should actually be the official name for this enemy. Spooky monster monkey man. What are you talking about? Anyway, like all the other enemies in this game, they want to fuck with my boy Harry, they mess with the best, they die like the rest. And I have always thought that it was kind of weird how this game is also referred to as quintessential survival horror. I mean, I guess it is in the sense of it following along most of the hallmarks of that genre, but the amount of ammo and healing items they give you is just absurd. I'm talking hundreds of bullets and dozens of medkits, and you really almost have to want to die in this game. Or, I don't know, like, have your dog grab the controller in his mouth and then run out of the room or something in the middle of combat. I think if you actually spent the time going around and picking up all of the ammo you can find, you could more than easily commit genocide on the vast population of Silent Hill's monsters. There's a few boss fights in the game, and they are kind of overwhelming, only because of the size of the creatures you're up against. But most of them can be beaten by running to the side of a room and then just shooting at them before running over to the other side before they get close enough to attack you. The final boss is really the only one you ever have to worry about because it shoots out these bursts of lightning that are really hard to avoid. But even then, whenever you take any damage, you can just pause the game to go into your inventory and heal right up. Combat definitely hasn't aged all that well, though mostly just in the mobility you've got playing as Harry. Now I know this dude's not John Wick or anything, but he really just is this slow, clunky moving prick. He might as well just be wearing clogs for shoes because that's kind of what it feels like when he's moving around. Silent Hill comes from that period of time where these kind of games always used to have tank controls and the long and short of it is that you're either going to like or hate these kind of controls. I mean, there's not really anything else to it. It's not a matter of not getting it or missing out on some kind of cosmic joke. I mean, some people just don't dig tank controls and there's nothing wrong with that. But there's still other factors to the animation and the controls which does make it feel kind of janky. If you're sprinting, for instance, and you come to a stop for like a second or so, Harry's going to still move a couple of steps forward while he tries to stop his momentum. You can strafe left or right and also run forwards or backwards, but you can't do both at the same time. So if you want to start strafing left or right when you're sprinting forward, you first have to stop sprinting, take your finger off the movement button, then press whatever direction you want to strafe in, which stops you dead in your tracks for like a second or so. Now, like I said, these are control mechanics typical for the time, but they can make it a tricky game to get into for first-time players. So, has it aged perfectly, and is it the kind of game that anyone could pick up and play? Well, in terms of the control scheme, I'd say no. But in terms of literally everything else, well, that's a hard yes. What is this? What's going on here? And I'd bet my left nut this thing would still scare the pants off someone. Like literally, your pants are going to come off when you start playing this thing, one way or another. Hmm. What is most important about Silent Hill though is the legacy it left behind, and since the first entry in the series, there's been a dozen or so other games, not to mention a couple of terrible films. What came out next in 2001 was Silent Hill 2, which went on to become one of the most popular games for the PlayStation 2, and what most people regard as being the best game in the series. You don't sound very happy to see me. This game didn't continue Harry's story, though it instead introduced an entirely new character with James Sunderland. James is heading to the town after receiving a letter from his recently deceased wife, who claims to be waiting for him there. This, uh, th this town, 
there's something wrong with it. It's kind of a similar premise to Harry with the dead wife being a catalyst for the events in the story, but that's about all the similarities this one has. Because honestly, this game is in a league of its own. The story in this one gets mega deep on a philosophical level and forces James to deal with repressed memories and emotions over his wife's death. It also explains a bit more of how the other world that Silent Hill works and how it projects differently for everyone involved. I mean, we already knew that someone's worst fears get manifested as their own personal demons, but it kind of explores how that works differently with these ancillary characters. Oh yeah? Why not? It introduced two of the series' most iconic monsters with old mate Pyramid Head and the sexy nurses, the latter resulting in thousands of confused boners from every guy who played this thing back in the day. You disgusting pig! Not to mention the character of Maria. I mean, there's so much going on with this chick you could spend an entire video talking about her alone, and I'm sure some people already have. I don't look like a uh, ghost, do I? And I think the fact that all I ever wanted to do was toss her on the nearest bed like a rag doll and go for broke says a lot about how well written she is, considering that's the entire point of her character. So comfy. Now, I do think Silent Hill 2 is a superior game when it comes to the gameplay side of things. The visuals are a lot better with great texture work and more detailed character models and you've got more dynamic lighting here that just looks great. Monster designs are far more detailed and animated, making them truly unsettling. And few things in this series can compare to that looming presence of Pyramid Head. The game's primary antagonist coming after you with that knife that looks like you could use it to chop down a goddamn pine tree. The controls are improved, moving and shooting feels a lot smoother, and you can now also combine items in your inventory to solve puzzles. Speaking of puzzles, you can even choose a hard difficulty puzzle mode to increase the challenge. So I mean, just on paper, it looks like an objectively superior game. And look, I guess it is, but to me there's just always been something so refined about Silent Hill 2 that somehow makes it seem less interesting to me. You couldn't care less about me. Could you? And the blocky, pixelated world created on the PlayStation 1 for the first game, I just find far more engaging and interesting than this one in Silent Hill 2. Silent Hill 1 to me is like that rock band that works out of a garage. The music is grungy and loud and the band members need to take a shower. But the talent and the soul shines through and it can't be denied. By the second game, now the rock band's got a producer and a recording label and they're working out of a pristine studio with all of the latest gear. The attitude and the personality is still there, but a part of that edge and rawness just feels like it's been smoothed down. It's not to say it's a bad thing and about the worst complaint you can make about a sequel is that it seems more polished. But I've just always found Silent Hill 2 to be a lot less visceral. Maybe it's got something to do with James as the protagonist instead of Harry. Or maybe it's because I've spent the most time with the first game. But I just think despite the second game doing everything right for a sequel, it can't hold a candle or a flashlight if you will to the first game. <laughs> Then you've got the third game, which is kind of like a combination of 1 and 2, and it brings back the grungy, metallic, and nightmare fueled environments from the first game. This has to be the best looking game out of these original three as well. I mean, some of these environments are just fantastic, or as they say in New Zealand, fantastic. But it includes the quality of life improvements from the second game and an insanely high level of audio and visual polish. The soundtrack is great, and the cinematics and the animation are insane, especially so for the time. This stuff right here was the absolute pinnacle of the PS2 era graphics and it still looks amazing nowadays, especially if you're playing the PC port. The level of detail with the facial animation and just the modeling in general is just superb. I mean, look at this shit. So you say. The main character Heather recently got added to Dead by Daylight as a playable survivor and a testament to how good she looked back in the day is that even on the modern Unreal 4 engine, they still couldn't get her looking as good. Also worth mentioning is that Heather is hands down the best girl in the entire franchise and just one of the best girls in gaming. Watching her go from a scared little pushover into a badass bitch that takes down an entire cult is just an awesome journey. Get the hell away from me! I have to admit that from this point on, my knowledge of the rest of the series is pretty basic. I've only ever finished The Room once and it didn't leave a good impression on me. And I've played none of the games that came out after it. I don't know any more than you do. I did see the first movie though, and I can say with authority that I found this thing to be absolutely terrible. Despite what fans might say about the other games in the series, I don't think anyone can deny that this film is a complete piece of shit. And I don't understand how anyone who's a fan of these games could watch that movie and say it's good. Story-wise, it's like a combination of the first and the second game, but it totally ignores all of the lore and the symbolism behind some of the series' key monsters. Like the nurses in Pyramid Head, who are only thrown in there because fans are going to be able to recognize them. 
It's the same story as Silent Hill 1, essentially, with Harry heading off to find Cheryl. But now instead, Harry is replaced by a woman named Rose, who fills in practically the exact same role and was only gender swapped because apparently the director said he thought Harry's body language and personality in the game was too feminine. It's nuts. This motherfucker took down an ancient god with a hunting rifle and stomped on the corpses of demonic children. There ain't nothing feminine about that. It's nuts. My main issue with this movie though is the violence, which is just excessive at times. And it's kind of odd to me because I mean, aside from the body horror aspect of Silent Hill's horror elements, it wasn't ever really a graphically violent game. They had a warning at the start when you turned the game on, but it was more meant on a psychological level, not as a warning for the level of gratuity. The sight of body parts strewn around the environments and blood-stained walls was definitely prevalent, but compared to seeing a woman having all of her skin ripped off by Pyramid Head... Well, this bit here during the final scene, which I can only describe as the best representation of menstrual cramps I think I've ever seen on film. But honestly, talking about these films is something for another video. Maybe after I polish off half a bottle of scotch and a bag of blow. Whether or not the gameplay is appealing to modern gamers, which is really on a case-by-case -case basis, I think the atmosphere and the horror aspect still holds up. Its low poly aesthetic is something that's still being replicated even with recent games in the current year. Titles like Lost in Vivo, for instance, or pretty much everything made by Puppet Combo. There's something about the simplicity of these older horror games that I still find unsettling and creepy on a nostalgic level and the memories of playing them as a kid is something I don't think I'll ever forget. And it's the reason why something so basic as a corridor in the Silent Hill Elementary School is always going to linger in my mind long after the lights have gone off, far more than anything else will in so many more other modern horror titles.